All right, it seems like we've got a good group who's joined us here, so I'd like to thank you all for your patience and thank you all for joining today. I'm Alex Ewer. I'm the Global Head of Marketing here at Munbo. Thanks for joining today's event. So now that most of you've joined us, we're going to go ahead and get started. So first off, let's do a quick reminder to let, that you can submit any questions you have today using the Q&A panel that you see during the presentation. I'll start off with a brief introduction of today's speaker, as well as some context on Munbo and how can we we can help you partner to implement and optimize a CDP for your business. After that, I'll hand it over to James for the main event. Once James finishes, I'll come back online and we'll address those questions live. So first off, to uh, introduce today's speakers. So myself, I'm Alex Ewer, I'll be your moderator today and I'm the Global Head of Marketing here at Munvo. I'm joined today by our special guest, James Myers our presenter, the Product Strategy Director over at Action IQ. Before I hand it over to James, I wanna give a little bit of background and context about Monbo. Our goal is to help you maximize the investment that you've made in your MarTech. So to that end, we partner with leaders across various aspects of MarTech to ensure that we can offer and support you with the right solution for all of our clients and for all of your unique needs. When it comes to today's topic, CDPs, we're able to deliver services starting with implementation to integration, helping you run services as needed to help you get complex projects off the ground. As you can see, we've been doing this quite a while, over 15 years, in fact. So with 300 plus marketing solution projects under our belt, we bring diverse industry experience, diverse technology experience to the table for every engagement. Without further ado, though, I'd like to introduce James, who's really the star of the show today, and he's gonna present today's webinar understanding CDPs and navigating the hype. Excellent. <clears throat> Thank you, Alex. Excited to be here. And um, I'll start off by going through some of the key issues that we'll be discussing today. In fact, um, what I'll do is, is actually address these issues through a story. And I think stories are, are my preferred method um, to make a uh, an otherwise uh, product-related uh, discussion more tangible and more relatable uh, for you as, as, a, uh, as a potential buyer or, or you as a user. Um, so what I'll do is talk about when CDPs make sense for an organization, um, what critical criteria need to be included, um, then unpack the different types of CDPs that exist. Um, and then importantly, um, the discussion should go into where does it fit in the stack overall? And so how does it interplay with other technologies? And then finally, uh, wrapping up with some stories and some, uh, some client success uh, case studies, including the ROI of the investment. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I was gonna tell all of this through a story. And <clears throat> the, the quick story that I'll start off with here is that I was coming back from a conference uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and it was the first time in my career um, that I found myself not wanting to go back to work. <laughs> and of course, I, I say that with a smile because I, I'm a bit of a geek and enjoy uh, solving problems like uh, like these for customers. But also, it's really, it's really that I was frustrated with constant pain that my colleagues were feeling. And so the, the company that I was working for at the time uh, was Lowe's Home Improvement here in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. And um, big Fortune 50 company, um, and my particular role was, was in data science at the time. And so having come from a, um, a, a hub and spoke type of, uh, of architecture there, I was supporting folks in marketing and in e-commerce um, while also supporting um, folks in IT. And so it was a bit of a um, the hub and spoke format there, but what I was observing was really frustrating me. And, and, and this really was the first time where I was, I was sitting in the, the seat of the plane and thinking to myself, I don't want to go back to work. And the reason why is because my colleagues were feeling constant pain. So you're seeing here, my IT teams uh, were being blamed and they were getting frustrated and they were, um, you know, just bemoaning the, the fact that they had to work on rudimentary problems instead of getting to the big, robust, uh, you know, high impact uh, projects that they wanted to spend their time on. You know, then my actual team on, on the analytics side, we were wasting tons of our time, uh, reintegrating data, cleansing, transforming. Um, and then we were disappointing our stakeholders over in marketing um, and e-commerce 
by missing their deadlines because we had spent so much time reintegrating and retransforming and, and, and shipping data. So um, what that meant is that the business teams, these in, in marketing and e-commerce here, uh, they weren't meeting their goals. And instead there were some negative consequences happening too. So if you think about these organizations being a bit more siloed, um, they were over touching their customers and they were not able to achieve the kind of scaled ultimately meant they weren't meeting their acquisition and retention goals. And just as a small anecdote here, um, I'll, I'll, I'll say that all of these were 100% true because uh, my wife, uh, I met her at Lowe's and she was on one of these business teams. So she constantly reminded me of, of the uh, kind of disappointments and so forth that we were, uh, that we were causing. And so again, as, you're, as I'm sitting here on this plane ride back, to Charlotte, I, I found myself, you know, you got to think differently, James, you got to the box and come up with a new way. And so <clears throat> if you are in that similar situation where your your CX team or your analytics team or your IT team or even your executive team are feeling these types of pains, a CDP is likely the right tool for you. So whether it's it's disjointed data or the inability to access data as a business user, or if you're on the analytics team, then it's it's silo data that's causing constant wrangling of data, uh, duplicate identities um, that cause distrust in, in data insights, um, or if you're on IT, the, the, the constant need to fix and maintain integrations, as well as the, the friction between you and your, your business stakeholders, or if you're on the executive team, you're finding your costs are growing uncontrollably because each new problem requires a new solution. Um, so there's a number of different uh, kind of signals that you and your teammates may be feeling. I wanted to make sure that those were, those were nice and tangible for you here in the first part of this presentation. Where we'll go next is where I made huge mistakes. And, and this is me being completely honest with you. Um, I was foolish and I didn't see the larger problem. And instead I just focused on this small component. And what I mean by that is as I ended up building the CDP for Lowe's, I thought that it only needed to do three things. I thought it just needed to de-silo all this disparate data, assemble all of these records into a, a single customer view for each customer. And then finally, just ship all that data downstream off to the email service platform, the advertising platform, or the website personalization tool. And I thought that if I did all those things, then I would solve the problem. But I actually only created a CDP that helped IT. And as I mentioned, my wife reminded me, um, this is why. You can see here that the, the solution that I made, in this case, it was inside of Apache Hive, um, but it could have been inside of Snowflake or GCP or Azure or any other of the big data platforms. They're all serving the same purpose here, where at the end of the day, I only solved one third of the CDP criteria. In other words, I successfully aggregated all the data into a centralized database but then I didn't go to step two and step three here, which are all about empowering the business user. So I didn't build a friendly interface for analytics and segmentation. And I also didn't build an interface that allowed for centralized orchestration across all channels. And so I look back upon it and I, I wish I could have done something differently. In fact, I would have chosen to license a CDP and here I, I picked back to the future because we actually would have needed to have done that because in 2014, there were no CDPs. So if no CDPs exist, um, then let's pretend that we could have brought today's marketplace backward in time, but let's understand the different types of CDPs that are out there. I think you all agree if, if you've been following the space at all, you would agree it's confusing. In fact, there's too many vendors and every vendor is out there saying, we're the best, we're the best, we're the best. And the reality though is, is there's huge, huge undercurrents to that that I can help explain to you. And, and I, I take pride in being very objective in my advice and in my perspective because it's my reputation that's at stake. 
And what that's led to is that industry analysts often regard us, and this is not just me, but my teammates as well, as being honest and, and actually helpful. We're going to share some very helpful information on the marketplace, including ourselves. Um, and so what you're seeing here is, is a quote by an analyst firm just a couple of months ago explaining how we often recommend other solutions, not our own solution, because we care about our reputation and making sure that folks view us as honest and helpful. So this slide you're looking at is probably the most important slide in the entire deck. And you say, well, James, it's kind of simplistic, right? It's, it, it, in fact, it's probably pretty obvious, but I need to unpack it a little bit. And so the most overlooked aspect of customer data platforms is that when vendors were building their CDP, they didn't have infinite resources to build everything for everyone. Instead, money and time were highly limiting factors. And so what that means is that on day one of vendors' existence, they faced a major crossroads. So think of the scenario where as they're building out their CDP, they have to decide path A or path B. And to make it very simple for you, we're going to unpack those two approaches. But even more so, they are mirror images of each other. So they're exact opposites. And so remember. So let's let's unpack what approach A is. Approach A is an application first CDP. And what that means is simply that these vendors put more emphasis on the applications. For example, the user interface is an application. The predictive models are applications. The journey canvas is an application. They put more emphasis on those than the underlying data infrastructure. So the data infrastructure is, is how the data is brought in, how it's stored, how it's computed. And now approach B is the mirror image. So in other words, focusing more on the underlying infrastructure than on the applications atop of it. And so what you're seeing here is a more robust, robust collection of tools in that infrastructure layer. You can see there's an icon for pipeline, which allows for transformation of data. And then you're seeing fewer applications on top. And then the understanding here is naturally that after the data infrastructure is built, the applications are expanded over time. So that's where the future focus is. Now, if you're a vendor in this space, this is a huge decision and it's very, very difficult to make. And I'm going to explain why. But for you as the buyer, it's important to unpack this as a criteria or this is a as a component of the decision because you'll understand why the majority of vendors in this space are getting replaced. In fact, there's a statistic out right now that 50% of enterprises that have deployed their CDP are replacing it. So again, 50% replacing their CDP. And so we're gonna explain why. So the pros and cons of a vendor picking approach A. First, they would get to market faster. And the reason why is because building applications is much quicker, much faster, much easier than building a robust data infrastructure. The second reason why a vendor would pick approach A is because the user interfaces can be focused on and the user interfaces become very attractive. So you can sign new clients very, very quickly. Now, there are some cons and we'll go through those very quickly, but they revolve around scale and, and inflexibility. And then finally, around the inability to stop the train once the train is moving down the tracks. And so what I'll do explaining that is simply say that once an organization has deployed a particular CDP, they don't want the vendor to come back and say, hey, we realize that we can't compute all of your data or we can't fulfill all of the use cases that you're, you now want to deploy, but we can if you'll allow us to stop the train, open the hood and strengthen the underlying data infrastructure. The reality, you know this as a buyer, is that no client is going to accept that because the client is already paying the vendor. So that's approach A. And what we'll do now is, is quickly understand why approach B has its pros and cons. And what you're seeing here is that because of the infrastructure first focus, 
it's more adaptable to all verticals and also to sophisticated use cases. Additionally, because of that infrastructure underneath, the applications at top of it are more reliable and more effective. Now, here's where the challenges come in. It's, it's all about funding and dollars. In other words, this robust data infrastructure underneath takes years to build. In fact, most organizations have told us that it takes two to three years. What that means is that in order for the vendor to survive in those two to three years of development, they need extra funding. So millions and tens of millions of dollars just to survive those early days. Then after they've built their product, they go out and they start signing clients to offset those sunk costs. The other component here is about expensive infrastructure engineers, which are inherently very, very expensive. So remember, if a vendor is in this space, is someone you're analyzing, they are one or the other. There's no middle ground. Uh, and once they pick one, they have to live with the sacrifices of each one of those choices. So let's reveal what each CDP vendor picked. We'll start off by explaining some different types, right? So there's the application first and infrastructure first, which we just talked about, but there's also this third type and they're listed here on the far left. So the data integration CDPs, while they are good solutions, they are not great solutions for the criteria of a CDP. So in other words, they are not meeting the criteria of creating a complete customer 360, of providing advanced analytics and segmentation, as well as campaign orchestration. And so if you wanted to dive deeper onto those types of, of solutions, I'd be happy to go into that offline or in another session. But we'll focus today on the application first and the infrastructure for CDPs. And what I'll do is explain those just real quick for you. So if you take Agile One here, for example, a good CDP, now they started off as a collection of predictive algorithms for predicting lifetime value or churn, um, propensity, et cetera. But if you know what an algorithm is, at the end of the day, it's just an application. And so that's why they are an application first CDP. Now I could go into each one of the others on this list, but I'll save that for a subsequent session if you're interested. What I'll do instead is, is simply call out that you're probably noticing Salesforce and Adobe being in different uh, columns here. So Salesforce being in the application first CDPs and Adobe and Oracle being over in the infrastructure side. And you know that they all kind of have similar um, approaches to their architecture. And so you're wondering, well, why is Salesforce an application first CDP? The answer is because Salesforce is still pushing their EverGage uh, site personalization tool as their CDP. And site personalization in its end of end of day is simply an application for your website. It's, it's not a, uh, a data infrastructure tool. So that's why Salesforce is on that side. Now, in the infrastructure side, you see ActionIQ, Redpoint, Adobe, and Oracle. And what I'll call out here about Adobe and Oracle they actually should have asterisks next to them. And the reason why they would have asterisks next to them is simply because they are infrastructure for their own cloud. In other words, they are designed to ingest and create a customer 360 just for their own tools. So very different than the red points and the action IQs of the world, which are designed to collect data agnostically from any type of vendor. So let's make it all even more tangible for you. I think this is what you might want to hear. So as a user or as a buyer of CDPs, there are pros and cons of each of these two approaches. And what I'll do is explain those to you very, very quickly. So approach A here, the application for a CDP is gonna bring very attractive user interfaces and dashboards, even additional predictive models uh, right out of the box. Um, as well as real-time capabilities. So for example, it might also bring um, a real-time site personalization capability if you don't already have a tool like Adobe Target or, uh, or Dynamic Yield or, or other in place. Um, now, the trade-offs are significant. So we, it won't be as adaptable because of its fixed data model or its fixed infrastructure. Also, the ability to scale to enterprise quantities of data are very difficult. So think if you've got millions of customer records and terabytes of data, uh, approach A CDPs are not going to be a great solution. Now, 
there are two final components here, and they're all about the quantity of data in the user interface. So if you think about a customer interacting with your brand across all of your channels, each one of those interactions becomes a signal. And you would like each one of those signals to be available in the user interface. And the reason why is because that creates information and intelligence for you to make better decisions. So you, you wouldn't have all of those signals inside of the user interface. And the reason why is because these solutions don't have massive computing power. So they need to shrink the quantity of signals that they surface inside of the interface. Now let's go over to approach B, which also has significant pros and cons. From a pros perspective, they're very easy to customize uh, because of that underlying data infrastructure. They also scale easily. Their predictive models are higher performing because they're operating on all of the signals. They're stronger in terms of the reliability. And the challenges though are relating to patients. So for example, some applications don't exist yet. For example, there may not be uh, real-time triggers uh, offered, or there may not be um, uh, a, a real-time um, profile API uh, built yet. Um, and then finally, um, it's about cost. Uh, these solutions are, are more designed for the enterprise. Um, they are more uh, robust and, and have greater costs to develop, which means that the costs for them are higher. So this is where I, uh, I smile again. And, uh, and think back, well, what would I do if I could go back to 2014? Because of Lowe's size and because of the complex channels and quantity of data, uh, they needed an infrastructure first CDP. And at the time, uh, Lowe's is a very big Adobe shop. And so um, if it were me, I would have explored um, Adobe as well as a couple of the other solutions in this group. Now, Let's get into the broader discussion though, because if, if you are a buyer of this technology or if you are a marketing technologist trying to understand this technology, I always tell organizations to think bigger. In other words, thinking bigger is understanding where the CDP fits inside of the tech stack. And it's all about the hub and spoke in this case. So the infrastructure for CDP here sits as that hub. It's designed to ingest data from online and offline sources. It's designed to sit next to your uh, Snowflake or your GCP or your uh, whatever big data platform you are using. Um, and so it's ingesting data from both of those sources. It's interacting, of course, with your advanced analytics tools. And then its job is to take customer-specific data and customer-specific models and ingest them and make them available to business users. So in other words, the whole purpose of this solution is to take all of that siloed and inaccessible data and empower the 80% of the organization that doesn't know how to write SQL. In other words, if the 80% of the organization is being tasked with making better decisions, they need data to make those better decisions. So it's all about democratizing data and democratizing insights to inform better segments and to inform better experiences that get orchestrated across channels. So if you think about those as, as high level criteria, it's actually important to think about the overall technology stack and how it performs. In other words, part of the reason why 50% of enterprises are changing their CDP today is because they didn't think about the criteria that are on this slide. Now, what I've done to make it nice and easy is there are eight criteria, but we've, we've grouped them together into four major outcomes. And those four outcomes are trust, efficiency, impact, and the control of risk and cost. And so what we're doing here is we're explaining in order to gain, like let's go through number one here, the, the trust row. In order for teams to be confident in the data that they use on a daily basis, there needs to be a single source of truth. And when they're calculating insights, it needs to be on all of the signals, all of the data. And so I won't read through each one of the rows here. Um, while, while you're reading through them yourself, you're seeing that the criteria for a CDP or criteria for its impact on your stack is much greater than simply checking a box and saying, oh yeah, they've got a user interface or oh yeah, they've got a, a journey, uh, journey management capability. 
it's, it's much, much bigger. And so as you're evaluating vendors, think about how the technology fulfills these criteria so that you don't become part of that 50% replacement statistic that I was mentioning a minute ago. Now to help you understand how this criteria comes to life, I've actually created some diagrams that are dynamic, that have colors, that have scores. And I think you'll find this very interesting. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna explain that eight criteria and you're seeing that listed there on the far left column. So you're seeing the eight criteria and you're also seeing numbers and colors. And so the numbers correlate with the individual criteria and then the color can either be green, yellow, or red. And what we're gonna do is explain why the score is green, yellow, and red for each one. So in this case, the Smart Hub CDP gets a score of green for single source of truth because there's one data repository for the business. It's complete, it's always up to date, and it's blessed by IT. Now, in terms of insights and being calculated on all their data, this is 100% of data, never subsets. So a score of green there, and all of those lead towards a trust score of four out of four. Now on the next two, you're seeing a score of yellow and green. And yellow here is regarding the self-service data management. So you're seeing the, the ability to ingest data from the, uh, from the, the big data platform or from the, the sources itself. And in this case, um, the ability to ingest data has not been provided yet or not been exposed to the user interface and instead is being relied upon by the vendor. Now, I know vendors in this space are building that capability later this year, um, but I also would say that there is some good news in which is that there are attribute builders exposed into the user interface, which allow you to create brand new attributes whenever you have a new use case. Um, and, and the greater thing is being able to use those attributes immediately. So no delays. Now, when it comes to the user interface here, it's super friendly and all of the data is exposed into it. All that leads to a score for efficiency of three out of four. Now we'll go through the remaining four criteria here rather quickly. The first is all about centralized decisioning. And the, the value here is that you're centralizing where your business stakeholders are making decisions. And the reason why is because it's all about creating seamless experiences. And if you don't centralize it, then channel A doesn't know what channel B is doing, or in other words, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So it, it decreases the probability of creating seamless experiences for your customers, whether that's marketing channels, service channels, or, or sales channels. It needs to be centralized decisioning. Now, the other component here, and, and this is what, uh, what, what leading analysts are saying, is there's, there's the battleground for the future is predictive analytics. And so um, if, if predictive analytics is the battleground for the future, then how well can my CDP take my homegrown predictive models and operationalize them so that my business users can make extra impact on their targeting and on their experience recommendations? Now, the other component here is having pre-built models that are offered by the CDP vendor itself. And in this case, you would like those CDPs to bring models that are fully configurable here. And so the smart hub vendors in this space do not allow you to fully configure those models themselves, but they can operationalize your homemade models so that your data science teams can spend time iterating and improving the models instead of spending all their time productionalizing them. All of those lead towards a impact score of three out of four. Now, the final group on here is all about uh, cost and control and, or, or cost and risk rather, sorry. Your CDP should be agnostic. And what that means is it should give you the ability to plug and play different vendors for the spokes that are around the hub. In other words, you should be able to plug and play different advertising platforms and different email service platforms and different call center applications instead of being locked into one particular tool. And the reason why is because these vendors in, in the, the different hubs are very innovative. And so you wanna be able to plug them in and gain value if they are 
you know, providing features that are beyond what you're, um, you're using today. So um, a score of four out of four, and then the summary here for you at the end. Now, what I'll do um, just to finish off, I wanna show some stories of client success, including the ROI. So um, Forrester in our case, interviewed a number of our clients. In fact, we, we had them interview four of our, of our biggest clients. And in this case, they wanted to identify how the platform was delivering value across revenue, margin, and finally ROI. So you'll see here that the revenue improvements relate to conversion rates, um, order values, um, advertising improvements, uh, labor and technology reduction costs, and finally, um, a payback of less than six months. So um, if, you're, if you're interested, we could send you that later, but um, it's a very, very impressive uh, report. Now, what I'll do next is, is explain a couple of, of uh, success stories or, or client case studies, just to make this extra tangible for you. So <clears throat> Genworth Financial here, an S&P 500 insurance company, um, they came to Action IQ in the middle of a significant shift in their revenue model from selling through agents uh, to selling directly to customers. And they had no infrastructure uh, to get data. Um, so they also had problems with, um, with governance and um, that's because they were highly regulated industry um, and new um, constraints and, and regulations from CCPA, GDPR and, and more. Um, so using Action IQ, um, it was all about consolidating and unifying data, um, giving their stakeholders that 360 degree view of the customer. Um, and you're seeing a quote here uh, from Deirdre Watts uh, about Action IQ being that smart hub approach, um, enabling them to consolidate data and provide self-service access. So again, the 80% of the organization now has access to data, to insights, and to orchestration capabilities for those seamless journeys. Now, I'll also add one more here for Pandora. And Pandora is, is intriguing here also because of the, the size of their organization. So in other words, Pandora is unique because they have an unbelievable quantity of data available. Um, in fact, just in 2019, ActionIQ ingested over 30 petabytes of data from Pandora. So an extreme quantity here, and that's because they have a large user base, um, I think somewhere around 154 million users, um, but also every one of their interactions when they're listening to music and clicking on um, music material gets tracked into their platform. Now their challenge, um, they, they, um, they infamously called it the SQL crazy train. What that means is that they spent hours per day um, interacting with their, their stakeholders and analytics and IT to rebuild SQL, to uh, re, uh, retransform data and, and unify data in order to get the right segments for their campaigns. So it, it resulted in slow speed to market and obviously no self-service capabilities for their business. And so what you're seeing here are results in terms of customer acquisition costs, um, as well as LTV. And so big improvements here uh, now, what Pandora would also tell you is that it's not just initial improvements, but it's all about the customer experience. And what they mean by that is that it's, it's the use of journeys across the life cycle of the customer from acquisition to engagement to uh, loyalty and finally in retention. So uh, stitching together those journeys improves the LTV because of, of those uh, seamless approaches. So what I want to do now um, is, is open up for questions and see if there's any, any, uh, any instances where you'd like me to double click on a particular area or touch upon an ancillary or adjacent area. Um, so I'll take a, a quick sip of water and, and uh, hopefully you have some great questions. So great job, James. Thanks for, uh, thanks for taking us through that. So we, we have received some great questions during the presentation. Um, thanks to thanks to those of you who sent those in. I'm much appreciated. So James, once you're ready with that water, um, let's go ahead and get started. Excellent. Thank you all for uh, for submitting questions and feel free to continue to submit more as, as we're talking here. 
So the first one I have is, um, it's specific to an industry, actually. It's an interesting one. Um, do you have any examples of client success stories or, you know, working in the uh, pharmaceutical industry? Yeah, good question. Um, I know of a number of, of smart hub vendors uh, that, that work in the pharmaceutical industry. So um, take, um, take, for example, the unique operating model there. So the, the unique approach here and, and probably the biggest obstacle relates to um, the structure of data. So being able to analyze different accounts and different doctors within accounts um, and then even users and so the, the trick here often relates to being analyzing data and segmenting data and, and even orchestrating experiences at those different levels. So, um, so the vendors in this space absolutely need to have a data infrastructure for CDP. Um, so think about the uh, being able to adjust data or, or view uh, insights at those different levels because the infrastructure is adjustable and, and, and more dynamic underneath. Um, yeah, so we could talk more about the, the specific use cases uh, hereafter, but um, but I, I, I would I would focus you for sure on that final uh, categories of CDPs if you are in the market. Good question. Thanks, James. Uh, we've got a couple more that have came in actually. So another one, can you explain a bit more around uh, self service data, data ingestion, or insights a bit more in detail? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so self-service, um, particularly, um, it goes across the platform. So think of um, from, from ingesting data to uh, activating data or even, you know, build, building journeys. Um, so that's the spectrum. And now we'll unpack the different uh, areas where self-service um, can be brought in. So vendors are, are, are quickly um, opening up their platforms so that um, end users in IT or data engineering, um, or even in some cases data analysts um, can can grab data from different uh, sources, whether they be uh, you know digital sources online or even databases offline, um, and and ingest data themselves. Um, what that does is is it allows the end user, and, and in other cases um, maybe it's a partner or an SI, um, it allows them to be independent of the vendor themselves. Um, so the first area there is about ingesting data. Now the second and perhaps the, the area where is the most painful for end users is all about the transformation of data. And in this case, um, I know of at least one vendor in that uh, infrastructure space, and I'm pretty sure it's the only vendor um, that allows you to transform the data into the exact format that fits your needs. Um, so the, the user interface provides features for transforming, for um, creating new attributes, for editing existing attributes and more, so that the data fits the use cases that you, you require. Now, every vendor thereafter offers segmentation capabilities and um, some analytics capabilities. So, um, so that's, that's uh, less interesting for me to unpack, but um, it's a great question about the first two areas of data ingestion, which are, are are being developed still, and then the the second area is about data transformation that um, is available at least at least by Action IQ. So, good question. Thanks, James. Um, honestly, we're getting probably more questions than we usually do. So, I you know as long as everyone is uh, willing to hang on a bit, we'll take a couple more. Um, I, th I think this is a good one. A lot of us have, you know, where where do we see CD? CDP projects being initiated from? Is it coming from IT or the business marketing side? And, you know, do IT orgs understand modern day CDP? How, are, how do vendors help bridge that knowledge gap? Yeah, great question. Um, most often um, it's the business that gets tasked with um, some type of a PL. And what I mean by that is um, there is some performance goal attached to every business team. And when they don't meet those goals, um, they're the first one to say, hey, I, I, need, I need some type of uh, new solution. Now, it doesn't mean, however, that it's the analytics and the IT organizations that, that champion the IT, or, or sorry, champion the CDP uh, themselves. And the reason why they can also champion it, and I would say that IT and analytics are probably 40% of the time, and business stakeholders are probably 60% of the time. Um, now, 
the analytics and IT groups are the ones that are frustrated with the constant wrangling of data and, and the custom integrations and the custom solutions that they've tried to stitch together years after years. You think of my old self and how I foolishly built the CDP for Lowe's. It, um, it would be a mess to maintain that. And it was a, a mess to maintain it for the two years after that I built it. Um, but the whole point here is that if you are a, a organization that's exploring a CDP, please do not make the mistake of purchasing or evaluating vendors in a silo. So if you work in IT or analytics, please bring in your business stakeholders. And if you work in business, please do the opposite. Bring in your IT and analytics because they see different sides of the same coin. In other words, they're gonna value different components of the solution because you want to avoid being part of that 50% statistic that's replacing their CDP. And most often the organizations that are replacing their CDP are because they only valued one side of the coin. So they, for example, they only valued the data infrastructure side of the CDP and they didn't value the applications on top of it. Or the other side is they overvalued the applications and didn't value the infrastructure underneath it. So it's important to bring all the stakeholders together because you'll, you'll see each other's blind spots. That's a great question. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, James. I think we can take, uh, we'll, we'll take two more here. I think there's two good ones that came in and ones that are good to clarify. So this one specifically says, uh, so box product for a CDP, or do you prefer consulting services to create the CDP? Oh, I, I, it, it blocked out just for a second there at the beginning. I think you said, um, is Action IQ a uh, out of the box CDP or is it a services? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and I could obviously answer a part of that. I mean, it, you know, Action IQ is is a product, absolutely, and James can speak to that. It's it's an out of the box product, um, and you know, that's one of the reasons Monvo's here today is partnering with Action IQ as we provide consulting services to help integrate that CDP within uh, within your your Martech stack. But you can add to that if you'd like, James. Alex, that was perfect. Um, that was perfect. <laughs> do you want to add on one more question at the end uh, beyond that? Yeah. Then. Yep. I have let's, time. Let's do the last one, folks. Thanks for hanging on for those who have, which is a good amount of you. Um, so you mentioned that Adobe and Oracle CDPs integrate service within their own stacks primarily. Conversely, how well does Action IQ play with the Adobe stack? Would it be disadvantageous to use Action IQ in an otherwise Adobe shop? Yeah, no, very insightful question. In fact, <laughs> um, the reason why it's so important to integrate with uh, with Adobe and Salesforce and even Oracle and Microsoft is because some components of their tech stacks are best in breed. In other words, they have best in class capabilities for, uh, think of uh, think of sales cloud for Salesforce or, um, or service cloud for Salesforce, you know, great, great tools. And so Action IQ's clients are best in class uh, strategy. And so what that means is that they've, they've wanted us to integrate seamlessly. And in fact, um, their customers uh, tell us that we integrate better with them than they integrate among their own portfolio. Uh, so yes, we, we take those integrations very, very seriously because all of our enterprise clients have at least some mixture of Adobe, Salesforce, Oracle, and, and Microsoft in their stack. Um, so it's important. Yeah, great question. All right. Thanks for uh, going through all the paces with that, James. And really, thanks to all of the attendees for submitting um, great questions. Appreciate the engagement. That's that's fantastic. Um, thank you all for taking time to join this webinar. If we didn't get a chance to address your question live, um, we'll definitely reach out to you after the event. And don't hesitate to reach out to us on munvo.com via LinkedIn or any of the channels so we can talk more about solutions customized for your business. I've been Alex Ewer. I've been here with James Myers. And have a great rest of your day.